His company has developed one of the very first e-learning platforms for ATPL theory. It was the first to use the iPad to deliver ATPL theory via e-books and the first to deliver 3D gamification for the ATPL. His primary focus is now on preparing for a change from book-led learning with supporting gamification to game-led learning supported by e-books. Please welcome uh, our first presenter, Graham County, his presentation on possible futures for pilot education. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I come from the poor man's end of pilot training which I'm afraid looks absolutely nothing like this. And so I'm really envious of all that lovely, sophisticated tech that's on display out in the hall outside, but more impressed by the elegance of the thinking about how it should be used. But, and it's a big but, we at Padpilot are slightly worried that some of this sophisticated training may be a little bit like building castles on sand. And the sand in this case is the lack of proper pilot education. In particular, we're convinced that the so-called ATPL theory and the way it's examined is deeply flawed and unfit for purpose. And neglect of pilot education is really dangerous because education is the primary countermeasure against the threat of inadequate training. And unfortunately, this industry tends to believe that training alone is the best way to address the causes of accidents. But some aspects of some accidents are really better understood as failures of education. Let me give you a couple of examples. So, we tend to attribute this accident to poor training, and conventional wisdom has it that the first officer was impro improperly trained on the use of the rudder. But we see it differently. Had this pilot been better educated about the strength of aerodynamic forces and the relative weakness of fin structures, he may have been equipped with the knowledge to defend against his erroneous training. And certainly, we would argue that much of the cause of this accident lies with failures of education. I mean, surely, we shouldn't have to invent a training task that teaches pilots not to pull flight control circuit breakers. To us, this accident is a symptom of an education system that's evolved almost entirely in the wrong direction. So, for example, in ATPL theory, we treat this like it's some sort of interesting engineering artifact, standing in isolation from other systems. Whereas what we really ought to be doing is teaching the cascading failures that stem from an engine quitting. Yes, when the engine quits on short final, we need to be telling them about those nice shiny levers like this. But when an engine quits in the cruise, we really should be educating pilots to instinctively think beyond the engine system. We absolutely have to break out of this 60s tech mindset and immerse our students in this. So my purpose today is not simply to describe all the glitzy new tech, which I am going to do, of course, but to suggest ways to harness it in the service of better education. And my apologies to cabin crew, this is going to be very pilot-oriented, but nonetheless, the ideas do read across. Okay, so what we have at the moment then is conventional CBT uh, or digital books with animated content. Yes, it looks nice, but we shouldn't fool ourselves. The underlying teaching philosophy is really unchanged from the 15th century. But within the last 18 months, mobile devices such as iPads have become powerful enough to let a user directly interact with complex 3D models in a way which was previously completely unthinkable. We also now have the ability to draw and write on tablets, a very simple facility that offers huge opportunities in pilot education and examination, which has so far been almost completely overlooked. 
Then we have virtual reality, when the entire field is artificial. And VR certainly does have a role to play in education, but probably, in our view, only for certain specialised conditions. And then we have AR, augmented reality, in which virtual objects are placed on the real world. But this format, with its rather clumsy reliance on phones and tablets, is, in our view, really a bit of a gimmick. More, more, not really useful as a learning tool. It has a certain fleeting wow factor, but we can't think of any unique contribution to learning that it brings. But what holds more promise is the imminent arrival of low-cost, high-res AR headsets, providing the user with a vivid, hands-off experience. And what's really exciting about this tech is the nature of the experiences that they provide. Here's what one press reporter had to say. So why is this significant then? Well, firstly, if experiences really are laid down in episodic memory, then an experience of, say, uh, an engine failure at V1 should be as easy to recall as what you had for lunch. But secondly, what differentiates an experienced pilot from an inexperienced one is the number and range of experiences. So if it's now possible to do it, should we not be teaching by providing experiences? So this tech isn't merely the next generation of PowerPoint. It could be a genuine paradigm shift in the educational contract. Perhaps phrased like this. So there's no accepted term at the moment to describe this range of new learning possibilities. So we give it the name Experiential Digital Learning, EDL, to describe learning by absorbing experiences rather than merely assimilating information. So let's look at how EDL concepts can be applied to education. Well, first off, we can replace large tracts of text in books with 3D models, which a student explores and interacts with. So here's an example of an app we produced um, to explain the gas turbine engine. And it replaces the majority of about four chapters in our book. And as you can see, the model can be moved to any orientation, zoomed in or out. And controls on the left provide quick shortcuts to reveal the engine's innards. When touched, each component has an associated text explanation tabbed into three distinct, distinct areas. Functional description, its design, and of course, its associated threats and errors. And the little blue icon links to the appropriate page in the student's book. Controls on the right colour and animate the component. And every detail relevant to a pilot is modelled. Next, using AI headsets, we could enhance and supplement conventional book learning. So here a student's reading a chapter describing the G1000, and displayed in AR is the same unit situated in a life-size panel. So while learning one thing, the students also become familiar with the panel layout. In this example, we created a 3D globe. The instructor can draw directly onto its surface, so he can give an insight into the relationship between 2D track projections and real-world, three-dimensional great circles. The instructor can pause and turn off various information layers, depending on the teaching point. For example, to show how the combination of sea temperature, land masses, and Coriolis combine to generate hurricanes. But the student isn't just learning about hurricanes, he's beginning to grasp viscerally the underlying physics of MET. And it takes no leap of imagination to imagine how we could improve his operational understanding if we also overlaid, say, transport, air transport tracks. Uniquely, piloting is a profession which requires operating in 3D, on a timeline that can't be stopped. So we could easily teach not just the basics of TCAS, but also the dynamic 3D environment. So whilst learning TCAS symbology, students could experience how things look and feel in real time. 
Now, I slowed down this sequence for presentational purposes, but the student would experience real-world closure speeds, gain insights into just how time-critical some scenarios can be, and to learn to think and operate in three dimensions. And we can extend the concept of time criticality into our teaching of traditionally dull subjects like air law. So as well as learning the rules of the air, a student could also learn the realistic dynamics of the scenario and how to react. Because it's one thing to know what to do in a given situation, but really quite another to recognise quickly when this situation is developing and act in time. Now, unfortunately, we can't convey on a 2D screen just how wide and deep the experience would be in AI. With a headset, the student would have to turn his head and scan the horizon, just as he would in a real aircraft, to pick up the approaching threat in time. Examinations based on EDL concepts would allow us to escape the tyranny of multiple choice. So in its simplest form, we could apply pen-based testing to a paper chart, but equally, we could apply it to a moving ND display. And we could use the same pen technologies to test not just knowledge, but practical skills. So in this example, the student uses a virtual protractor and ruler to solve a simple math problem. And the really important point about this is it allows us to create problems that can't be cheated. The student really must have the necessary skills to put that X at the right spot. Pen-based technologies can also be used on 3D surfaces or virtual objects. So in this example, we're asking for a hand-drawn response and analyzing the student's performance based on where and what he's drawn in the sphere. And then we can use fully immersive 3D environments to teach and test knowledge. So in this example, the student is being tested on his knowledge of CAT3 operations. But he could just as easily be tested on the learning uh, on sequences that cover every detail in this model, from the errors in the aircraft's lighting and the aerodrome to uh, recognition and radio calls. Or we could even expand it to time-critical testing of views from inside the cockpit. Further up the scale of sophistication, we can use our game system to examine knowledge and understanding. So in this example, a student is required to deconstruct the gas turbine until the first turbine stage is revealed. But compare the previous student's response with the response behaviour of another student tasked with the same objective. So look at this guy's response. I mean, clearly, this guy's struggling. He's floundering around, and he eventually stumbles upon the right answer. Now, because he does stumble on the right answer, any traditional marking re regime would say, OK, he scored 100%. But our software tracks not just the end result, but how the student got there. And so we would reach a very different view on this student's level of competence. Finally, we could use VR to take experiences to a whole new level. So take, for example, Air France 447. No amount of studying the accident report and the videos would give us a visceral understanding of why these three experienced pilots failed to recognize that their aircraft had stalled. But just imagine the insights we could gain by immersing ourselves in a VR reconstruction. VR could put you in the cockpit, surrounded by the sights and the sounds and the noise and the confusion that this crew experienced. VR would let you swap your point of view from the captain to the first officer. Perhaps then we might understand, for example, why this captain struggled to get back into the loop during this confusing scenario. Would this be time well spent? Well, it would take just over four minutes to expose a student to this scenario, Four minutes better spent, we would argue, than learning how to use a circular slide room. And more importantly, it would expose the students to fearful experiences from early in their training. 
So perhaps VR experiences like this might help to develop psychological resilience. So when we're thinking about the possibilities of EDL, we really need to look beyond those nice-to-haves. Uncheatable, time-critical, dynamical assessments ought to allow us to abandon the fetish of formal exams and do away with exam rooms and timetables. Because if we did that, we could deliver education in lockstep with training. We could insert it at the appropriate points in the training pathway. Teaching with experiences would deliver a more experienced and more resilient pilot, just at the time when the experience levels amongst captains is falling. So in short, what we're arguing for is nothing less than a profound blurring of the boundaries between so-called theory and practice. But unfortunately, from a regulatory perspective, we're a huge long way off from achieving this. So take, for example, our commercial application here on the jet engines. Hugely expensive to create, but it's enjoyed almost no commercial success. Why is this? Quite simply, because the training system is a creature which has perfectly evolved and adapted to the current examination system. And so unless and until that changes, there really is no realistic prospect of raising the educational bar. I mean, let's not forget it. Students are our customers. So we respond by training them for exam passing rather than educating them for career challenges. And that's what I mean when I said earlier that the system's evolved in entirely the wrong direction. So clearly training providers like ourselves can't catalyse the change. But there's a plethora of industry committees and steering groups but they're not yet fundamentally challenging the current approach. And not nearly enough attention is being given to placing education in the right points along the training pathway. EASA really needs to change up a gear and perhaps rely less on people who are merely experts in the old way of doing things. Yes, I know, education is very much the unsexy end of the industry. But that doesn't make it unimportant or irrelevant. If we neglect it, if we continue to think of it as something slightly old-fashioned that we do with books, then we risk looking for answers in accidents in entirely the wrong place. We may end up chasing our tails with more sim time, using more sophisticated simulators, when the true solution lies much deeper and earlier in the training pathway. So not every aspect of education can be treated this way. But one thing is absolutely certain. Training students to pass multiple choice exams is not going to serve their or our industry's needs over the next 20 years. Everything I've shown you so far today is either done, prototyped, or eminently doable. All we need is the vision and drive to implement it. Thank you.